This episode is brought to you by Ursa Minor Outfitters. Folks, I'm absolutely in love with my Loon mug. It's handmade. It's an absolute piece of art. Whether it's at the office or at the house, people keep asking to check it out. If you're not a Loon fan, they also have other beautiful mugs for wildlife fans of moose, bears, and eagles. They specialize in products highlighting the outdoors and local pride through quality design by local artists. They've even started expanding into items beyond mugs, like apparel, dog accessories, and soon candles and more. They also try to partner and highlight other small businesses, and in some cases, forgo profits in lieu of charitable giving to help their community, such as the dog rescue. So check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for our four-legged hiking partners, they also have a portable silicone dog bowl and also a sweet over-the-collar dog bandana. Go check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and don't forget to enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. Welcome everyone to the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm your host, Ivan, and together we'll embark on a weekly journey connecting with extraordinary hikers from all corners of the U.S. and beyond. As a warm embrace of summer envelops the Northern Hemisphere, we've had the privilege of conversing with remarkable individuals throughout this season. Their experiences and adventures will leave you yearning to hit the trails. And on today's episode, we're heading back to Northern California and talking with Gino about his amazing adventures in and around Northern California's beautiful landscapes. You can follow him on Instagram at gonzalez 1981. Gino shares with us in this episode how over the last five years, his passion for hiking in the outdoors has led him to some spectacular locations across the state of California and even the Pacific Northwest. He shares some of his favorite hikes within a short drive of his home base, his amazing road trip along the Oregon coast and into Washington, and provides us with some insights on how he's been able to capture some of his amazing photographs and videos on the trail. Without further ado, let's jump into this episode with our guest, Gino. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm really excited to be sharing this episode with Gino. We're going to be talking about some of Northern California's beautiful sights and scenes that he's been able to share with us on his Instagram feed. Gino, thank you for joining us on the podcast. You know, we always like to start off by asking our guests how they got started hiking and how long they've been hiking for. Hey, Vaughn. Well, thank you for uh, having me on the podcast. I listened to a couple episodes prior to this and I uh, really enjoyed them. So uh, thank you very much. So I've been hiking for about four years now, pretty seriously. I mean, periodically throughout my life, I'd hike here or there, but really logging some miles, it's been about four years. I gained a lot of weight in the early 2010s. I got really heavy, about 330 pounds. And I was looking for something to like set goals, something I could look forward to on a weekend basis. I was spending some time in the gym and I was losing weight and I was eating better. But at the end of the day, you know, the gym can get really boring. And so I started finding myself looking for things I could do. And I kind of went back to my youth and said, man, you know, I really liked being out in Yosemite and just being out, um, you know, exploring trails and things like that. Maybe I should start hiking. So I bought some cheap hiking boots and a cheap bag. And uh, I just went on like a little two mile hike and I really loved it. And it kind of took off from there. And I'm kind of, I get obsessive about things. And so I found myself challenging myself week in and week out. Okay. I did two miles. All right. Let's see if I can do four to do six. And uh, within about a year, I had lost about 110 pounds and I had gotten to myself where I could consistently hike 12, 14 mile day hikes. And it's kind of taken off from there. That's awesome, man. And, you know, I got to be honest, I am jealous of your home base because you are very centrally located where you can go in either direction and hit just an absolutely beautiful spot in the outdoors. How would you describe the hiking scene in your neck of the woods? Specifically where I'm at, I'm in the valley and that's like farmland. And I know a lot of people think of California, they don't think of farmland. But in all reality, you know, I think it's over 70% of all the fruits, vegetables, and nuts in the whole 
United States are grown here. And so I live right in the heart of it. And, you know, so there's nothing right here in my backyard. But the advantage I have is, to your point, I'm centrally located to the Sierras, to the coastline. You know, I can get to Tahoe in two hours. I can get to Point Reyes in a little over two hours. I can get to the, the gate of Yosemite in two hours. So, yeah, there is there is some uh, strategic advantage I have. <laughs> being where I'm at. But yeah, there's nothing. The only you know downside to that is there's nothing right in my backyard. But that said, I do have within a two hour drive, I can touch, you know, many of the places that people have on their bucket list. So that that is great. Is there one um, specific region that you kind of gravitate towards when you do have a free weekend, whether it's the Sierras, Tahoe, because I you could choose a little bit of everything and, and have it? Yeah, you know, it's really there's a lot of seasonality to Northern California hiking, especially in the high Sierra. I mean, most of the high Sierra is inaccessible for a big chunk of the year, you know, especially this year with, you know, just insane amounts of snow and rain we got. I really enjoy the Sierra hiking. That's kind of my bread and butter. I like long mountain loops. Stanislaus National Forest has some amazing places to hike 15, 18, 20 mile loops. And I mean, you just have every sort of deep, thick woods. You're hiking through granite, you know, mountaintops and then down into lakes and creeks and rivers. And it just for biodiversity, it doesn't get much better than that. I would say that, you know, there's a multitude of places I love to go, but I think the Stanislaus National Forest and a lot of the areas just north of Yosemite really have my heart. And I got to admit, yours has been one of the hardest episodes to develop questions because every picture, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the region that you are exploring. So to kind of focus in on, you know, that two hour window that you have, and, and you mentioned the National Forest, and I I love highlighting state parks and national forests, because especially in California, you get the same beauty or equal beauty as some of the big national parks, but with less crowds. So that one that you, you spoke about um, near Yosemite, what kind of makes that one so special? Well, Stanislaus National Forest, like I said, it's just the biodiversity, and it's one of the first places I really wanted to explore. So maybe there's some nostalgia there. Not that I've been hiking forever, but you know, when you, it's kind of like your first love, you know, you just kind of, uh, you know, um, it's kind of like that. Golly, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I kind of have this thing where the, you know, that I say like my favorite hikes, the next hike. So one of the advantages I have for being in Northern California is there is so many places to hike and so much biodiversity. So, I mean, I don't really have to be pinned down to one location or the other. It's really just limited by my ability to find the time to drive there and do the hike and and preferably get back home because I do like my warm bed. (laughs) (laughs) You know, one place that really caught my attention and it was one that seems to have made you work to reach it, but to also get out of it. And that's Uchiri Bar. And we were discussing how to pronounce it, but it's spelled E-U-C-H-R-E. And it looks like um, it's a river gorge, beautiful, clear water, cascading falls. But it is a little bit of a workout to not just reach the water, but then also to get back out, right? Yeah, those are my favorite hikes, really, just generally speaking. A river canyon. Oh, If you tell me, if you want to get me to hike and you say we're going to a river canyon, I'm all in. And I don't care if it's down 2,800 feet, 3,000 feet. Let's do it. There's something special about, you know, climbing down and putting your feet in that river, man. It's just, it's almost like a, it's a spiritual experience. And that specific trail, you, you literally park at the trailhead and start walking down. And so in your mind, you're excited about what you're about to see, but you're like, I'm going to have to come back up on my way out of here. (laughs) So that's kind of the daunting task in the back of your head, but it is an incredible, incredible place. And I do want to get out there this year. Uh, The only downside to that location is everybody complains about bugs in the summertime, but that place is super special for bugs. I mean, there, I mean, you need the head net, you need the bug spray, you need everything you, I mean, whatever you believe or pray to, you need that, you need it all, (laughs) man. I mean, it is, it is insane. I've never, I mean, and like I said, I've, I've hiked all over the Western United States and that place is is for some reason, fly, mosquito, gnat, 
central. It's insane. Oh, man. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> but if you can bear it, it is, it is an unbelievable experience. And, and I've hiked that trail twice, and I've never seen more than three or four people on the trail at the same time. Oh, wow. I think I looked it up, and it's between like 1,500 to 2,000 feet of elevation loss on the descent. But then you have to make it back up on the climb back out. And Absolutely. I got to ask, because... You know, those type of places, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, makes me want to jump in. Have you had a (laughs) chance to test out what the water's like? Because I can imagine, especially with the winter you guys had, it must be a little colder than usual right about now. Yeah, I recently went up to Stanislaus National Forest, as we referenced before, and I did a hike off of uh, Pinecrest Lake. It is called Chloe's Bath. And Chloe's Bath, I mean, you can env- envision in your mind. So it's a little like a bath in the mountains, right? So you kind of hike up to this peak, maybe 7,900 feet or so. Maybe you're climbing maybe 1,000 feet from the base of Pinecrest Lake up to this mountain. And it's typically just, a, I don't know, 20, 30 feet wide, maybe five feet deep at its deepest. I hiked up there a couple of weeks back, and it isn't Chloe's Bath. It's like, Chloe's Olympic swimming pool now. I mean, it's insane. I have never seen it like that. And I actually posted some photos fairly recently of that, of that place, but it's a, it's a phenomenal location. It's actually one of my favorite hikes. I mean, it's definitely a top 10, uh, because you do have to do some, some legit scrambling to get to the top. I mean, you know, there's some points where it's probably more comfortable to bear crawl versus actually hiking. It's a great hike. And when you get up there, your reward typically would be, you know, to spend a little bit of time in Chloe's bath. But, uh, this year there was no way, shape or form that was going to happen. It, it was just roaring. And I was just thinking, man, I mean, I couldn't even imagine trying to brace yourself in that. It was, it was insane. So Gina, you know, one thing that I'm interested because in, I've only been to the Eastern side of the Sierras, um, near Lake Tahoe. And, you know, people talk about the Eastern Sierras, the Western Sierras. What are some key differences between both slopes? And I know this isn't a fair question, but I, I got to ask, is there a favorite between either the Eastern side or the Western side? Oh man. Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, I'll cheat and I'll say hey, Mammoth Lakes is such an incredible spot and you kind of get a little bit of both worlds, right? So you get the eastern treeless peaks, big granite chunks that are just jagged and vicious and they look incredible from a distance. But you also get like the tree line side ledges and you get the lakes and the creeks and things like that. So, I mean, they're both special in so many different ways. In 22, I attempted to summit Mount Whitney and I attempted because I fell prey to altitude sickness. I got very, very sick right around 12,500 feet, which was really unfortunate. That said, the experience outside of the altitude sickness was incredible. Where I, I made my mistake was I had injured myself training and I was doing uh, upper falls in Yosemite and I rolled my ankle at the top of Upper Falls. I rolled it really bad. I was able to make my way down the mountain, but my ankle swelled up to the size of, you know, a grapefruit. It was huge. So I couldn't really train. I was committed to a group. And in my head, I said, oh, I can power through this. But I just, I did not have the conditioning needed. So it was a feat just to make it to the Great Western Divide and be able to be able to see that you know, that viewpoint and see Banjo uh, Lake and, and essentially look into Sequoia National Park was pretty amazing. But I was told there was another, you know, the last mile and a half, I was climbing 1500 feet. I just said, I, I just can't do it. My head is pounding like a drum. I feel like at any given point, I could just fall over. And so I made the 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 call to, you know, think about, you know, my health and my future and and not push forward. And, you know, I went through a, oh my God, a wave of emotions. I mean, I cried. I, I was mad at myself. I was just, you know, I, I mean, literally every emotion you can go through, I went through going down the switchbacks <laughs> down Mount Whitney. And so that all said, it, I still value the experience. And looking back, I, I learned a lot. But yeah, it was uh, it was a wild day. And and, and the, I think the most wild thing is on the way back, you get a little frustrated. So you lose your way, you get off trail a little bit. And I ended up walking like 26 miles that day. Oh, <laughs> in and out. So it was still my longest hike ever. But, yeah. you know, it kind of, you know, I still have that that want that need to, to summit Whitney and 
you know, I had uh, submitted for a permit this year and unfortunately didn't get one, but that was a really, really long winded way of talking <laughs> about <laughs> essentially the snowpack and the, and the Eastern Sierras are you basically, it's a mountaineering trek this year. And so it's, mm. I, I don't know if it's going to be possible for people to take the traditional trail route and summit Mount Whitney until maybe the late summer, early fall. Wow. The other great place that you like to highlight on your Instagram feed is the Northern California coastline. I feel like Southern California gets a lot of the attention because they're the popular beaches, but the Northern California coastline is just vastly different, but beautiful in its own own ways. How are the coastline trails along the, the Northern California beaches? I love the Northern California beaches. Southern California beaches, to your point, are the most popular and they're beautiful in their own right. And they're warm. And typically, Northern California beaches are cold beaches. That said, they're not for everyone. But if we just start at Point Reyes, I mean, that is such a, an amazing place because you have deep, thick forest. You have ferns growing wild. You have more wildlife than I've seen in any other place that I've ever been. It's not unusual for you to see uh, large coyotes, bobcats, dozens of deer, there's tule elk. You'll see an occasional condor, an eagle. I mean, giant fa- uh, red tail hawks. I mean, it is unbelievable the amount of wildlife that you can see on a trail in Point Reyes. And, you know, there's a lot of great trails where you start in the woods and you're hiking through the woods and then you come down along the coastline. So that's a very special place. And then as you move up the coast, you have Bodega Bay that's beautiful. And then you keep on going into Jenner and Fort Bragg and up into Sea Ranch and Mendocino County. I mean, those places are just incredible. I mean, they're just, you know, you have these giant cliffs and jagged rock everywhere. And I mean, they're just incredible places to hike for a number of reasons. But I think the number one reason is how many places in the world can you hike on a 2,500 foot cliff and oversee like this vast ocean? One of the things I love about hiking is how it humbles you. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're just sitting there and you're looking at the Pacific Ocean. You're like, and this ocean has been here for millions of years. And here am I who, I mean, I'm just a speck of dust in, in the world, you know? And like, so if you have a big ego, go spend some time <laughs> hiking along the coast or, or through the, the giant redwoods and look up and see, man, this tree's been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I mean, I'm going to be gone and he'll still be standing here just looking around, you know? And it's just like, I, I just love that aspect of hiking because it really grounds you in what's important. And it really puts your life into perspective, in my opinion. I think for for a lot of hikers, that's something that they really enjoy about hiking. Now, you were able to venture past Northern California, and you came up into my neck of the woods. You did an amazing road trip to the Oregon coast, and you hit a lot of the, the special highlights that the Oregon coast has to offer. And then you went waterfall chasing in Washington. What were some of the memorable locations and places that you visited along the Oregon coast? Oh. Oh, man, everything was amazing. Uh, we went up to uh, up to five and got into Ashford and Medford and then crossed over and into Bandon. And then we cruised up the coast the whole rest of the way. And so, I mean, we hit so many places. Uh, I would say the highlight for me, though, was the Lincoln City area. And specifically, we stayed in an Airbnb in Otis that was right on the mouth of the Salmon River. And I mean, we talk about, I talked about wildlife earlier. This place was insane. I mean, elk, bald eagles just in the trees right above our Airbnb. We were canoeing with with seals, otters every single day. When the tide comes in, you can't see anything. But when the tide goes out, you see crabs. I mean, you can literally just grab a giant crab right out of the river. (laughs) It was so wild, man. And uh, it was just, um, honestly, it was one of the most spiritual experiences of my life to wake up in the morning and walk out on the deck of this Airbnb and see the Salmon River going into the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it was just, it was mind blowing. And I mean, I wish God, if I could live there, I don't know if I'd be a happier person. You know I mean? it, just, it was so wild, man. I mean, yeah. it was just, it was, it was an incredible place. That definitely stands out. But then as you go up into, and I believe it's called uh, Hug Point, just north of there, or Hug Beach. 
I mean, that place is insane. I mean, it was so beautiful. And then obviously ended up in, in Cannon Beach. And, uh, you know, that's a great town too. And I, I think that that place is as special as the beach is cool and the Haystack Rock is amazing. But the town is really cool too. So, yeah, uh, yeah no, that was a great experience. And then making our way into Washington, that whole Mount Baker area is just, I mean, it's waterfall central. But I would say that the coolest trail I did there was... And it is a famous trail. I think every PNW Instagrammer has photos of the Franklin Falls, right? So, yeah. But Franklin Falls, I mean, it is a special place. I think the good thing for me is, is I'm a morning guy. So I don't have any problem leaving my house at 3, 3.30 in the morning to, to hit the trails before everybody else. And what tends for, to be normal for me is I'm already on my way back on an in and out and as people are coming out for the day. So like I've already experienced, hung out for 30 <laughs> minutes, splashed in the falls, and I'm already coming home, you know? That was the deal with Franklin Falls that day is uh, we started really early in the morning and we got to the falls and there was nobody in sight. And so we really, really got the, the falls to ourselves and there's something special about like the exclusivity of being in a special place by yourself if that makes sense you know and just to experience that you know with you or a small group and it was an incredible spot and then i would say the next day i went to twin falls and it was pouring rain and so there was nobody out i mean it was dumping rain and that place by yourself was another like where they have the uh, they just have benches kind of set up randomly and like just to sit there and you're like, I got rain gear on. I don't care. You know, it's dumping rain and I'm just <laughs> looking at the waterfalls and I'm like, this shouldn't even be legal to be able to sit out here by myself and enjoy this beauty. It was it was a it was a very memorable experience for sure. You really captured the Oregon coast and, and Washington's waterfalls just exquisitely. For me, I, I spent about two years in Astoria. So I knew Cannon Beach. Okay. And one place that I really enjoyed and you and your family got to visit is Oswald West State Park, or um, yes. otherwise known as Short Sands. And for people that don't know this, the end of Point Break with Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze, the original Point Break, was filmed there at Short Sands. So when they're like oh, wow. looking at that last wave, it's it's not, I think they're supposed to be like in some tropical area. It's Short Sands in Oregon. But that place, I mean, you, you capture the waterfall that a lot of people miss because they don't hike along the beach. But just the short trail from the, the parking lot to the um, cove is just unbelievable. Absolutely. How was your experience there? Did, were you able to capture that um, area without the crowds? Because I know in the summer, it, it just gets packed with people. No, unfortunately, we were we were very deep in the crowd. <laughs> So I don't always, I'm not always able to escape the crowds. I do my best, but yeah, sometimes they're unavoidable. But, you know, I would say that um, that place is so vast and there's so much to look at, even though there was a lot of the people and the beach is so deep, you know, it's, it's just, it never really felt crowded. So if that makes sense. Talking about beaches, Gino, the one place that comes up frequently in your feed and that also has a special spot in my heart is Oahu. You've been able to visit the island a few times and you've been able to do a little bit of hiking. What are some of your memorable hikes there on the island of Oahu? So we have family there. So we were pretty much going every year. I I have to say I need to hike a lot more on not only on Oahu, but on all the Hawaiian islands. I haven't taken great enough advantage of that yet. But, uh, you know, I think there was one special hike my family and I went on was Manoa Falls. That's not the longest hike and it does get busy. But if you catch it at the right time, it it is it feels like you're you're by yourself for a period of time. And that place is very special. And I actually I don't remember the exact story, but I believe it is sacred to the to the native Hawaiians. And I believe there's something to the pools. And I wish I knew the story better. But you definitely feel like you're in a spiritual, sacred place when you're when you make it to the falls. It just feels like it's kind of one of those scenarios and kind of hopping around here. But if you've ever been to Bernie Falls in uh, Northern California, it almost feels like you're in Jurassic Park. Like, like is this real? Like, is this? And, but Manoa Falls is another one of those places where you look up and you're like, is this real? Like, is this not a movie or is this not like yeah. man-made? This is insane, you know? So that that 
hike, especially because I did it with my whole family, always uh, stands out to me. Yeah, and you hit it right on the head. It, it's like something from Jurassic Park, especially like once you you make it to the trail and you just see all the trees and plants covered with thick green vegetation. And it almost, you, you realize that even though the city is like a five minute drive behind you, you're in mm -hmm. a deep jungle. And like you said, the hike isn't too far. And it's one of those places that's popular for a reason because it is a beautiful place. But you're right. If you can time it right, you can have the pools almost to yourself or maybe just sharing it with a few other people. And yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. It's beautiful for a reason. And I love that you guys stay in Eva Beach because that place for me had some of the best food on the island. If, if you're looking for local food, Eva Beach all the way to um, Waianae just has some amazing food. Yeah. You um, know, what's funny about Oahu is I've talked to a lot of people and they're Everybody goes, ah, I don't want to go to Oahu. And I said, you don't want to go to Oahu, why? And they go, well, you know, it's kind of like San Francisco on the water, like a tropical San Francisco. And I said, what are you talking about Honolulu? You're not talking about Oahu. Like, make your way away from Honolulu. Make your way away yeah. from Waikiki and, and start on that west side and go around the island. Spend some time in North Shore. If you're in North Shore, you don't know if you're on the big island. You don't know if you're on Maui. I mean, it's North Shore is, is a completely different experience than what most people experience when they go to Oahu. I am a huge fan of Oahu for a number of different reasons, but I feel like people don't give Oahu a, good, a big enough chance because they have this, oh, well, Honolulu. And, and, but that's just a small area on Oahu. And I, I think if people went out west and north they and, and east, I think they would really understand the beauty of Oahu. You hit it right on the head again. You could go to the North Shore, especially on a weekday, and don't have to deal with the with the crowds like you do in Waikiki and have just a, as good, if not better, beaches on that side. And same for the West Side. I think to this day, for me personally, the West Side beaches are, are the best beaches on the island. Now, on this podcast, Gino, we have a segment that we like to do where we do a deep dive into our guest's Instagram feed and pick a picture that captures our attention. And one of my favorite pictures from your entire feed is this one that you captured of sunbeams um, just shooting through these trees in the early morning. Like for me, just seeing it, it it's almost hard to comprehend because the timing had to be just right for the, the sun to be coming up and to be penetrating through all these um, branches. Was it something that you knew about so you kind of kept going to it or did you just come across it by the perfect timing just you know by luck i would say the more opportunities or excuse me the more times you go out the more opportunity you have to catch special moments you know i referenced at the beginning i've been hiking seriously for about four years now for me that means more no less than 750 miles a year for the last you know uh, the three prior years. Now this year, I'm probably not going to hit that number because of the weather that we got in Northern California between the rain and the snow, the, you know, there was a lot of landslides and it was just some dangerous conditions for the beginning of the year. Uh, so I won't get to that number this year, but my whole point by saying that is when you get out, when you go out a lot, you have the opportunity to catch, you know, some incredible moments. And I believe the one you're talking about was just in the, the Yuba River. And typically when you're in the foothill, the Sierra foothills, you're more apt to have a little bit more cloud cover, a little bit mist, a little bit more fog kind of sticks around there. And so, yeah, if you go up there into the Sierra foothills, you're probably more likely to catch that. But that just was like perfect timing. It was just, it was insane. I was actually, I was hiking at a little short trail. So I started early in the morning, I remember. And it was a, maybe a little four mile trail. And I went in and out really quick and I got in my car and I went up this dirt road to go to this other trail that was a couple miles up the road. And I turned the corner and that was out of my you know peripheral vision. And I go, oh my God. So I cut the car over really quick. I jump out and, uh, and I grabbed that shot. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredible shot, a shot I'm very proud of and uh, a shot I love love as well. Yeah. I feel like your feed could be one of those screensavers either on Apple TV or on Chromecast where you just run through the different types of pictures because, you know, they're, they're incredible. And for me, being a, a bit of a gearhead, I got to know 
What kind of device are you using to capture these moments? This is going to disappoint a lot of people, but I just use an iPhone, man. I don't use any lenses or anything. I just, I just use an iPhone. It's quick. It's convenient. Um, you know, it's light. I don't have to worry about breaking a thousand dollar lens. So yeah, I just, I started with a 10, I moved up to a 12 and now I use a 14. So the key for me is, and I'm not a photographer in, by any means, but what I try to do is capture the beauty of a location by really focusing on what am I seeing that's beautiful? Is it the waterfall? How is the waterfall look? Is it a mountain? Is it a summit? Is it a, a mountain view? Is it a river? Like what makes this beautiful to me right here as I stand here? And I do some weird contortion-y type stuff, leaning against rocks, grabbing tree branches, <laughs> hanging over <laughs> locations to try to grab exactly what I'm seeing to kind of, you know, so people understand like, you know, this is exactly what this location looks like if you're here. And, and so that's all I try to do. So there's a lot of squatting, laying down, you know, angular kind of, you know, and I don't know if this is common or not, but I mean, I'll take 500 shots to get seven to post. So I take a lot of shots, um, different angles. I'll, uh, I'll lift my camera up well above my head. I'll go low. Like I said, I'll squat. I'll do all the kinds of different angles. So yeah. I, and then I kind of give myself some time. I never start looking at or editing photos until I get home. And then I, again, I just use the editing function on the iPhone. So I don't use any editing apps or, or anything like that. So yeah, I, I'm just using an iPhone, man. <laughs> I think, you know, th that just gives you credit because, you know, people, especially if they're doing a, a long, intensive hike, you, you take a, a few pictures, maybe three or four, and then keep going. But in order to capture moments like you're capturing, it takes the different angles, like you're saying, contortioning your body to, to reach them, but to have a variety. And sometimes it could take, you know, 100, 200 shots to find that one special shot. So props to you. And I, I'm going to have to kind of have that in the back of my mind and, and do, you know, multiple shots because you just never know if shot two is going to be the right one or if shot 75 or 100 is going to be the right one. You just never know. Exactly. And, you know, I guess strenuous is relative, right? But I mean, I think my average hike is 12 miles plus. Day, average day hike is 12 miles plus. Mm -hmm. So I get my miles in, but I, I take the time to enjoy it. And if I see a beautiful view, I soak it in. And, you know, and then I'll grab my photos. And so I found this balance with, you know, getting my shots in, but also getting my miles in, getting, you know, the health aspect of it, uh, the therapy aspect of it, but also capturing the beauty of the location. And, you know, one thing I think you'll see about my feed is I don't really focus, I don't really feature myself very often. And the reason being is I just feel like, I don't know that we do a phenomenal job as a society of recognizing that the earth can't speak for itself. And, you know, we are the stewards of the earth. And I hope that with when people see my beautiful photos, that they take the time to say, man, you know, I didn't see any trash or I didn't see any pollutants or I didn't see anything, you know, in that that photo. And it wasn't because I edited it out. It was because it didn't exist. And so I just want people to recognize like, hey, we have to take care of this earth to, to be able to see these views for decades to come and for our kids and our kids' kids to be able to see those same views. So th that's the main reason I started the Instagram page is because I really wanted people to you know to think a little bit about, wow, man, this is such a beautiful scene, but then also realize, well, man, it's it's trash free. It's it's there's not excessive amounts of people doing all kinds of crazy things here. There's no graffiti, you know, things like that. And so hopefully that resonates with people. So that's a, that's a good reminder to be like, this is such a beautiful picture and it's beautiful because there isn't all this extra trash and to keep it that way. And I think that's, that's a good way to, to approach hiking is like they say, leave it better than, than what you found. And exactly. It, trek it in, trek it out, man. I mean, I, yeah. I'm a firm believer in that. So, and it's not hard. You throw some stuff in your bag and, and, and that's it, man. It's really simple. So I can't stand seeing trash on a trail. It's, I, there's very few things that irritate me more than that. And so hopefully people understand that we are the stewards of the earth and it is our job to take care of it. And hopefully, you know, even though 
my audience isn't massive or anything. I just hope that at least people see that and that hopefully that resonates with them. You know, one of the last hiking questions that I wanted to ask you about your travels, and I've always wanted to go to it. I think it's on a lot of people's bucket list, especially when it comes to Mexico. But you got a chance to visit El Pirámide del Sol, the Sun Pyramid in, in Mexico, which is part of an eight mile city, which I wasn't aware of. How was it visiting the pyramid and then... Did you get a chance to walk a good length of of the city? Yeah, so we walked everywhere we were allowed. So I went in 21, and so we had to deal with some of the COVID restrictions. So uh, one of the things we weren't able to walk the steps uh, of the pyramid, which was unfortunate because that was something I was really looking forward to. That said, we still had a phenomenal experience. Uh, We still were able to walk all the, the general city paths and really see the insane architecture that took place so many thousands of years ago. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that's Aztecan, but it's not. It's pre-Aztec. It's Mesoamerican pre-Aztec. So it's it's pretty phenomenal when you think about how old those temples are to be able to be there in person and see and then think back like this was once a working city with thousands of people walking around. Yeah, it's it's definitely an awe-inspiring moment and uh, something that I definitely will cherish for the rest of my life. It was uh, it was an incredible day to be able to do that. Absolutely. Now, Gino, this is a, a new question that we developed for the podcast for season three, because it seems like uh, a lot of our hikers do have a traditional post-hike meal. Is there a favorite meal that you like to enjoy after a hike? I'm a foodie. I love food. And honestly, like there's some people spend money on concert tickets. Some people spend money on clothes. Man, I don't have any problem dropping whatever it costs to eat a great meal. <laughs> like none at all. That said, when I'm hiking, I, I I don't know, man, whatever it is. I mean, I'll just, I don't really have a ceremonial thing. The one thing kind of that became a kind of a normal, something I carry normally is I always have trail mix and I always have beef jerky, which I think is pretty common. But my trail mix, I make. So I actually go to typically like Trader Joe's and I'll pick like different nuts and different dried fruits. And I kind of make my own concoction. Some of the guys I've hiked with in the past are like, man, where did you get this? And I'm just like, oh, I made it. And they're like, wait, what is that? What do you mean you made it? You know, and I'm just like, yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll get the roasted almonds and I'll get the the cashews and I'll get, you know, just whatever I'm feeling that day. And I throw it all in there and mix it all up in a big, you know, freezer bag. And, uh, so that's kind of my like, uh, go-to snack on the trail, but yeah, off the trail, I don't know. I don't really have like a ceremonial thing. I don't like eating meals. And I think a lot of that is from what I've read is like, I know I, I can see people, they'll bring subway sandwiches or they'll pack sandwiches and things like that is when you're in higher elevation. So if I'm spending a lot of the time in the Sierras, it kind of curbs your appetite naturally. So yeah, I'm never really hungry, but I know I need the fuel, especially on really long hikes. I'll pump those calories into me, but yeah, that's, that's not, even though day to day, I love food. And uh, I, I very rarely will say no to a great meal. I, I, it's just not some. That's not part of my my ritual. That's just not okay. part of my ritual. I, so I got to ask: Is there a Gino recipe for trail mix, or does it change with each visit to the store? It changes with every visit. It's just what am okay. I feeling that day? But what I have found is. I really like, and I didn't even know these existed until fairly recently. I really like peanut butter chips. They're like chocolate chip shaped, but they're mm. peanut butter. Yeah. Oh man, those are great. <laughs> so, and I, and I like to do the sweet and salty thing. I don't like it overly sweet. And I don't like it overly salty. I like to have that nice balance. So I don't tend to get many salted nuts. Like I typically like to do raw nuts, but then I'll mm. have like one salted item in there. I'll throw some pretzels in there for the salt. You know, obviously it'll yeah. help you with hydration as well. So it's, you yeah. know, dual purpose. But yeah, it's just whatever I, I I feel like at the moment. But I am a huge fan of two things. And they, these two things typically go inside my trail mix outside of the, the peanut butter chips are mm-hmm. dried blueberries and yogurt balls. I'm a big fan of both of those. Oh, I'm going to have to <laughs> see if I can locate some dried blueberries because I don't think I've had it in, in the trail mix. And and I think, like you said, especially if you balance out the saltiness and the sweetness, it's money. Um, yeah, absolutely, man. 
So Gina, when it comes to your, your, your pack list, do you carry any luxury items? And if so, which ones are you carrying? Man, I'm light. I'm really light. Like I'd say outside of the winter, cause you, you know, obviously you got to layer up and everything like that. Mm-hmm. I just carry a, a light bag, like a, a daylight bag. I mean, so I literally have water. I always carry a first aid kit. I tend to carry three liters of water. If it's a longer hike, I'll take three liters plus some some bottles that I can put in the side of my bag. I guess the only item I carry that, and that I wouldn't consider it a luxury, but it's socks. I always carry extra socks because especially when it's cool out, man, there's nothing worse than soggy feet. <laughs> so I mean, I, I always carry you know, two pairs of socks. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I think beyond that, it's just the normal stuff that people would carry. So Gina, we're halfway through the year as we're recording this episode. Do you have any upcoming hiking or outdoor goals for the remainder of 2023? Man, I had three permits I submitted for, didn't get any of those. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with, like I said, the unprecedented uh, winter we had, you know, I don't. I try to get out once a week. That's my goal. I have a family. Um, they they have things they want to do. They they for some reason they like me, <laughs> so they want to spend time with me. But I try to get out once a week, you know, and I try to make that time count. And I start early and I go late into the afternoon and I get a little miles in. So no, not necessarily for this year. Now next year, hopefully, and and obviously we needed the snow and we need the rain. Hopefully we get more of a normalized winter <laughs> going into next year. But I do long-term, I wanted one calendar year, I want to hike a thousand miles. That's a goal I've had. Nice. I haven't been able to achieve that yet, but that is a goal I have to hike a thousand miles in a calendar year. So hopefully I'll be able to do that before my body starts to break down. When you know, when you're middle age, you have to start thinking about that kind of thing. <laughs> so that is a long-term goal is, you know, hopefully I can do that sooner rather than later. But uh, I obviously, long-term, I want to get back and I want to summit Whitney. I've done dozens of hikes throughout the Yosemite National Park, but I've yet to summit Half Dome. That's mm-hmm. another one I have on my, my list. I want to do a thousand miles in a calendar year. I mean, I have all kinds. I mean, I could probably talk forever about it, but I mean, <laughs> I want to get to Patagonia. I mean, there's so many places I want to go. But I guess the realistic, readily achievable kind of goals that I can probably do next year are I'd love to get a thousand miles in in 2024 and summit Whitney and Half Dome next year. That would be I would be a very happy man if I could achieve those three things in 2024. But this year, I think I'm just more going to enjoy my uh, the opportunities I get and just try to have as much fun as I can in the outdoors. Right on. One of the beauties of hiking is the list is ever growing. Even though you check off mm-hmm. 10 hikes, you probably added another 20, 30 in that, in that time span. So there's always destinations, always trails to hit. And, you know, I'll be rooting for you to get those permits next year because I know those permits can be a tough situation to, to have to apply year after year, but we'll be rooting for you and hopefully we'll get to see some of those pictures. I appreciate it. This last little portion of the podcast, Gino, is the this or that questions. So I'm going to give you two hiking related topics and you kind of choose the one that you prefer out of the two. First one is, do you prefer ascending or descending? Oh, man. I'd have to say my preference is ascending. Descending, man, that beats up your knees. And the older I've gotten, the the more the more you feel it. So I'm still relatively strong. And so I can get up the mountain, but coming down is like, ugh. I'm an ascending fan, man, no doubt. <laughs> this one's gonna be tough because you you get the best of both worlds, but waterfalls or summits. Oh man. You know what? I'm gonna say summits. I mean, ideally I could have a waterfall on the way to the summit, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But man, when you're up there on a summit, and it doesn't matter, you know, where, well, and obviously we have the advantage here out west is we get a lot of beautiful summits. I mean, you know, and we're up eight, nine, 10, 12,000 feet. You get incredible views, but there's just so many summits where you're just like, God, man, what a, what a, what an amazing view. And we, and when you earn a view, when you don't drive up to a view, you know, and park and walk out 500 feet and you're up to some rail and you're like, oh, it's cool. Let's take a couple of selfies and get out of here. Like when you earn that view when you're hiking all day, I mean, it just means so much more. You know, I would say, yeah, let's go with summits. And this one's another tough one. Switchbacks are straight up. Ugh. I think just for the physical well-being, switchbacks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
even and though then, mentally it can look like, oh man, there's a lot of switchback. Yeah. But yeah, I think I prefer switchback. And then are you a trek pole person or a trek pole hiker or freehand? Freehand. You know, I bought trekking poles, assuming I'd, I might need them, but I haven't used them yet. So yeah, no, I, I'd prefer to continue to do freehand as much as I can. So right now that's where I'm at, and, but I'm prepared in case I need them. And then this one's a new one, but uh, trail runners or hiking boots? You know what? When I rolled my ankle, I talked about on Upper Falls, I was wearing trail runners. So never again, never again. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a boots guy, man. And and high boots, uh, at least three quarter height. Now, when it comes to the trail systems, are you a fan of loop trails or out and back trails? Oh man, I love a good loop because you know, you're seeing more, but it tends to be that most of my favorite hikes are in an ins and outs. So I'd have to say in an ins and outs. And then when it comes to bodies of water, I think you, you already answered this one, but do you jump in or do you stay dry? I got to touch the water, man, in some capacity. So, I mean, I, I, we made it up there. We're there. We got, we got to, we got to fill the water. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine you've experienced this on, on some of the summits that you've done, but when it comes to sunsets or sunrises, do you have a preference? Oh man, they're both special, but I'm a sunrise guy. Like I said, I'm a morning person. Like I, I just, I love a sunrise, man. It's new beginnings. There's something special about the morning silence. I wake up early and, and, you know, in the winter time, you know, it's dark out when I wake up and that still silence of the morning special. And when you get that daybreak and that sun pops and something you'll probably notice on my feed is the clouds. I'm a big cloud fan. I love clouds. And when you get those cloudy sunrises, man, it's just, I don't know if anything can beat a cloudy sunrise. And then you guys, especially in California, experienced enormous amount of super blooms all along the state. So when it comes mm -hmm. to spring flowers, do you prefer spring flowers or fall colors? Oh, man, I love both, but uh, I'm a spring birthday. I love the spring. So I'm going to say the spring flowers, uh, especially, yeah, this year. This year has been incredible. We've had some some great blooming. So, yeah, it was definitely a super bloom this year. So, yeah, I'm going to go spring flowers. There, there's something special about the new beginnings associated with spring and, and, and flowers sprouting. It's, it's really cool. And then the diversity of color, you know, I mean, in the fall, you get a little bit of diversity of color, but you typically just get your tans, your browns, your yellows, some reds. Man, you're up in the in the Sierras and, you know, you're getting that spring bloom. I mean, you can get everything, pink and purple and yellow and orange and red. And it, oh, it's just, it's special when you, especially when you're up on in kind of the lower Sierras where you still get a lot of blooming. It, it, it is a special experience to be in there in the spring bloom. Now, the last one, Gino, is probably the most decisive one, but do you tag a hike on social media or do you not tag a hike? You know, I've kind of gone back and forth on this, but I dislike the mentality of like the whole gatekeeper thing because it's it's not so much about gatekeeping i mean most tigers that i know and me specifically i mean we just do the research we find the trails right whether you're using one of the apps or just google maps or wh however you go about it but you know that information is readily available to everybody that said, I tend to not tag geotag. And the main reason I don't is because you still see the graffiti, you still see the trash, you still see the lack of respect for the environment. And, and I, I just, I can't condone that. So typically when I tag places, it's obvious places, Yosemite National Park, you know, something to that effect. But I don't know that I've tagged a trail in a very long time. So I would say that my normal practice is not to tag. Now, what I will say is if we have a rapport online, if we followed each other and we like each other's photos and you reach out to me and you say, hey, where's this trail out? I'd be happy to share the trail information. And sometimes I'll even grab the, uh, the link to the trail and send it directly to you so there's no confusion. So I'm happy to do that, but I kind of, you kind of have to, I don't know, get vested with me first before I share my trail <laughs> info, if that makes sense. No, yeah, especially some of the places you're going, you know, that it's just, they're not able to support large crowds. But I am seeing that a lot of people online are going to that. If it's a popular, well-known destination, they'll tag it, but they won't specifically tag the trail. 
That was it for the this or that questions. You know, for our listeners that haven't had a chance to follow you online, what are some of the the places that they can find your pictures and also follow you either on social media or if you have a website? Yeah, you know, um, I'm a I'm a construction professional. I uh, you know I I um, this isn't what I do. I'd love to eventually maybe one day do this kind of outdoor thing for a living, but uh, that isn't in the cards today. I got to get kids through college and things. So, uh, so, so that all said, I just have my Instagram. That's pretty much it. It's uh, G Gonzalez one nine eight one. You know, I post pretty regularly, maybe not every day, but four to five days a week. And you know, I think I do my best to to spread a lot of positivity on my page. I feel like there's a lot of avenues to to get negative information or bad information or or fake news or whatever. I just feel like, you know, if we all just focus on spreading a little bit more positivity and love and support, we'd be a better place. The earth would be a better place. And so I try to keep my page very, very positive. Uh, Even days that I don't feel the happiest or the most positive, sometimes those messages are for me. They're not even for the general public. And if they resonate with people, then fantastic. Uh, But yeah, I just try to do my best to post beautiful photos and positive messages on a daily basis. And if that's something you enjoy, please check it out. I highly recommend to, to listeners to follow Gina and we'll be sure to um, link your Instagram profile in the episode show notes so people can check you out and see some of the gorgeous pictures that you're taking. Gino, it's been awesome talking to you. And, you know, I look forward to seeing what 2023 has in store for you for the outdoors, but appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. And that brings us to the end of this episode alongside Gino. We extend a heartfelt thanks to him for coming on the podcast. Make sure to stay connected and follow his upcoming adventures on Instagram at gonzalez1981 We have an incredible lineup of episodes planned throughout the summer, and we can't wait to share them with you. New episodes will be dropping every Monday, with occasional bonus episodes on Friday. To ensure you never miss out on any thrilling tales, remember to hit the like and subscribe button. Your support means the world to us. Don't forget to join our vibrant community on Instagram at Hikes and Mikes. We'll be sharing episode visuals, my own personal hiking content, and so much more. Let's stay connected and continue to inspire each other on this remarkable journey. As we bid farewell, remember to tread those happy trails, embrace the great outdoors, and keep the spirit of adventure alive. Until next time, my fellow explorers, happy hiking. A special shout out goes to our incredible audio editor, Alex, whose exceptional skills and dedication help bring each and every episode to life week after week. Thank you, Alex, for your invaluable contribution to the Hikes and Mikes podcast. This episode's music was created by Ketza. Follow him on Instagram at Ketza Music. This episode is brought to you by Flip Socks. Whether you're on the trail, on the job, or in the yard, Flip Socks will keep Mother Nature out of your boots with their innovative nylon sleeve. You no longer need to worry about any annoying debris getting trapped in your boots during your hikes. Simply flip down the nylon sleeve over any boot to prevent Mother Nature from finding its way inside, keeping your feet comfortable all day long. To get your first pair, visit flipsockswithaz.com and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10 percent off your order and for listeners who use the promo code at checkout i'll be donating 100 percent of the season two promo code proceeds to big city mountaineers who provide transformative experiences through connections to nature that strengthen life skills and build community for youth and disinvested communities across the nation so if you're tired of bits and pieces of the trail finding its way into your hiking boots pick up a pair of flip socks today with the promo code hikes mikes 10 to get 10 percent off for website and promo code see the episode description